Thank you guys for tuning in today and welcome to another episode of Know Your Stuff, where we interview policy experts, researchers and scientists on basic definitions, concepts. My name is Zan Raza and today we'll be talking to Dr. Ramani, who is a clinical psychologist and professor of psychology at the California State University in Los Angeles. And if I may say very humbly, she's a superstar on the internet and has helped create a lot of awareness and understanding on mental health issues. She's also an author and her latest book is called Don't You Know Who I Am? How to Stay Sane in an Era of Narcissism, Entitlement and Incivility. Dr. Armani, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Zain. How are you? I'm doing great. Before we get into the topic of trauma, which we will focus uh, on today's interview, let us begin with your personal motivation and journey. Talk about your journey and personal motivation that led you to pursue the field of psychology. It was curiosity above all else. You know, I'm the child of immigrant parents in the United States, and I think that sense of otherness often left me sort of a little bit sort of on the outside looking in, which I think always made me wonder, how, why do people do what they do? Why do I do what they do? And trying to understand sort of how to integrate my parents' culture with the United States. I had always been interested in sort of the brain and brain science. And then fast forward, I ended up deciding to pursue my PhD. I was working with um, researchers in New York City on HIV in the, um, gosh, I guess that was the late 1980s, at another pandemic. And, um, and so at that time, I got really interested in the relationship of mind, of body, of behavior. And then I went on to UCLA, got my PhD, incredible experience, amazing program. And then I've been a professor. But, you know, being a psychologist, it's it's almost the only other thing I wanted to be as a child was an astronaut. And I have to say, being a psychologist is every bit as great as an astronaut, because when you think of the number of neurons and connections in the brain, it's a galaxy and human behavior is infinite. And it's the one thing we encounter every day, whether we're in the grocery store, whether we're with our families w in, at work. And so I sort of felt like this was sort of a great career and a great pursuit for understanding everything going on around me. But most importantly, I think since I was a child, I've had a singular motivation, which is what is the way I could alleviate human suffering? And so this was sort of what that, this seemed like a great pathway to do it. So that's sort of what my singular goal is. How do I alleviate human suffering? That leads me to our next question, which is uh, right around this area. I would like to get your take on the field of psychology. Uh, the scientific field has seen so many changes, especially during the 20th century and now due to the rise of the internet and social media age. How do you think this field has developed since you began and has it been able to keep up with the increased use of the internet and social media? Oh, I think psychology, it, it is one of those fields that is, that is, it's changing. It's changing as fast as tech is changing. You know, when we talk about psychology, it's always had a history, right? The ancient Greeks talked about it. Ancient man would cut into the skull. They knew that the answers were all up here, you know, and then fast forward to the early part of the 20th century, where for the first time we're having a conversation that there's this intrapsychic process, these emotions matter. And then fast forward again to what really in the most recent 20, 30, 40 years, where the developments have really come up is in neuroscience. We're really understanding how the brain works. We're understanding epigenetics. We're understanding how our environment impacts sort of genetic, uh, how, how genes express themselves, how brain connections are made. We are really learning that this brain of ours doesn't work solo. And so those have been the most massive developments. But in the same breath, I have to say, you know, what happens in somebody's neuroscience lab when they're looking at, you know, cellular connections, as of now, doesn't have a lot of respect to what I see in a therapy office. You know, when I'm seeing human pain, me understanding all the dopamine in the world is not going to help me sort of hold that person's hand through it. So where I think psychology is fascinating is we almost still hold on to our shamanic origins of being present healers. But I think at the same breath, we're very much scientists trying to find really the kinds of the, the empirical reasons for why people do what they do. And I think that's a really magic middle space that we're in right now in the field. I don't think the reductionism is enough. And obviously, we're not magical. So it's finding that middle ground. And that's where we've really made leaps and bounds. But to your point about technology, we're a social species. Human beings need other people. In fact, our brains, our memory systems are contingent on there being someone else. So if you and I, I don't know, we're siblings and we're growing up, you must have siblings, maybe, I certainly do. My sister remembers things about my history I don't. My mother remembers things about my history that I don't. I view a group of people, a family, a community, almost like the cloud. It's like a big shared hard drive 
and we all have each other's memories. We need each other's for those memories. And so it's how we organize our world is other people. So here we are in a time of technology where we have become a little bit more isolated and we communicate through technical devices. We look at each other through screens if we look at each other at all. And I think right now the human brain or the human psyche is experiencing a little bit of malnutrition. And then you add the pandemic on top of that, where all we have is technology as a way to mediate our interactions. And I have to say that we're, we're as psychologists, we're sort of building the airplane in the sky. I don't know how this is all going to play out. Very interesting. One of the things that I think about psychology that have I think still disputed is whether certain conditions come through nature versus nurture. And for example, you mentioned neuroscience. I see the danger there, even though although I'm pro-science and I think they should continue research, I see the danger there as viewing humans as hardware, where just this little fix over there or there could uh, solve the problem. Whereas just like you mentioned, the way we organize is very complex. Um, j just before we get into the topic of trauma, could you Talk about how you, how you stay, stand on this topic of nature versus nurture. It's both. I mean, and, and really where it's, I'm seeing the, where this is where those two fields, like I said, sort of the, the, the sociological elements of psychology and the, or the psychosocial elements as we call them, or the neuroscience really come together is in this field of epigenetics, that genes actually get turned on and turned off depending on environmental conditions. We're about to talk about trauma. Trauma is a great example of that. Another turn on, turn off we see is poverty. And to me, mitigation of poverty globally may be the single most important thing we could do for psychological reasons. If that was the only reason we did it, that would be sufficient. We can think of lifelong challenges that poverty raises in terms of epigenetic connections prenatally all the way to end of life. You address that, you've ad addressed a huge part of the equation. So what this means now is that this human brain that seems like a self-contained hard drive, as you put it, is actually very vulnerable to the influences around it. It's not just, it's not just neurons that are internally contained. All of this is shaped by the world it's in. And we're arrogant if we don't include the psychosocial piece. I think, I, I don't disagree with you. I think there's an arrogance to neuroscience. There's an incredible importance but there's also an arrogance. And like I said, in 2020, when we talk about psychology and the practice of psychotherapy, it is as much shamanistic as it is neuroscience. And when I'm in that room, I have a singular responsibility, which is to bear witness empathically to my client's pain. That is a very, very ancient healing practice that goes well above what happens in neuroscience. But when I do that, Zane, when I do that, what ends up happening is that neural connections are changing. That empathy, that bearing witness is actually directly impacting their brain. So these two things are very married. Let us return to the main focus of today, trauma. Let's begin with the very basics. Could you first define what it is and also talk about the evolu evolutionary reasons why this mechanism developed? So trauma is an experience. It's usually, it's, it can be an event or it can be a series of events that occur that are not part of the typical human experience and that bring harm or significant fear to the person experiencing it. So it is not, so an example of a trauma, the most classical example would be something like a sexual assault right? That is not a normal part of the human experience. It either brings harm or even the threat or witnessing it happening to someone else. Even if it's not happening to you, witnessing someone be harmed is also considered trauma. Trauma hijacks the brain. We have in our brain a system called the fear network. It involves three elements of the brain, the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the prefrontal cortex. These systems work together to not only monitor the environment and what's going on around us, to remember what the threats are and aren't, to emotionally regulate, and then for us to make decisions in the face of that. When trauma happens, it again, it hijacks that fear network, and it results in a person who perceives 
paralytic fear in places where it doesn't exist. So in the extreme, the example of that would be post-traumatic stress disorder. Let's say you were walking down the street late at night. Somebody jumps out of a doorway, jumps on you, beats you up, takes your wallet and your phone, does you significant harm, and leaves, okay? Your brain is impacted by that experience. The number of, of, of neurotransmitters that flow through, you're scared. Walking down that street is going to be a problem for you. Walking around at night is going to be frightening for you. By themselves, that street is not what harmed you, but your brain will generalize. And if you don't address it, over time, being outside of your house at night may become a problem. So now your brain is experiencing everything as a major threat. So your nervous system, your sympathetic nervous system is always running on high alert. You're very on edge. You're jumping out of your chair. You're constantly monitoring your environment. Trauma really hijacks a person. And, it, and, and if, it has a, if it has enough of an impact or it happens consistently, for example, a person who is in a very abusive relationship or is abused as a child repeatedly, that can make some major changes, not only in a person's brain per se, but in their psychology. In my opinion, the term trauma is used very loosely today in everyday interaction. Uh, even myself, I sometimes come home and say it was a traumatizing experience for something very minor, for example, waiting in a line for three hours. Uh, and I hear other people say it in that way too. I know they don't mean it that way, but it's still part of everyday terminology. I think therefore it's important here to differentiate what may constitute trauma and what may not. Is there a ladder system that measures the severity of trauma or to put it differently, that assesses the various degrees of trauma that one may experience? Trauma is very perceptual, right? Now I think there's some things we can agree upon. Waiting in line at a coffee shop is never gonna qualify as a trauma unless someone hit you over the head with a hammer while you waited in line, right? But for example, let's say maybe a car accident. A car accident that might have been relatively minor, your car got damaged, maybe you hurt your neck a little bit, but nobody died and you were even able to work in a couple of days. But for one person, maybe they were a new driver, maybe they were in someone else's car, maybe they were in an unfamiliar place, just that one accident may have had such an impact on them that they do, that they, their mind, their body all experience it as a trauma. So trauma is definitely on a continuum. Obviously, there are things we can agree upon that are traumas, a rape, witnessing a murder, um, being a victim of violent crime. I think we're all in agreement that that qualifies as trauma. At the lower end is where sometimes it becomes very, very perceptual. We look at things like the severity of the trauma. We look at the proximity to a trauma. So, for example, if there was a shooting in your town, but you didn't witness it, That's very different than looking at it out your window and obviously more different than being the one who shot. So there's obviously those things like proximity and the duration of the trauma. Is it something that happened one time, you got mugged in the street, or is it something that's happened repeatedly? Somebody who was abused physically throughout their childhood or is abused physically repeatedly in, a, in an intimate relationship, for example. Those kinds of things matter too. But I think, again, waiting in a line is not a trauma. Being yelled at you know, by a friend while uncomfortable may not qualify as a trauma if, you know, if, if there wasn't a perception of threat. But saying it's that perception of threat that matters. If that person is screaming at you, but you also see the glint of a gun in their belt, you might say that just being yelled at isn't a trauma, but now you realize they have a weapon or a knife or something. Now, the anticipatory fear puts it in that gray zone of whether or not it's a trauma. So you're absolutely right. It's very perceptual. And the ways we measure it in our research have a lot to do with the main question we ask. Did you feel that your life was at risk or the life of somebody close to you was at risk, like your child or something? We use that as sort of a benchmark for whether something or not qualifies as a trauma. When some tra something traumatic happens, there's um, people that are part of it. Not everybody is affected in the same way. Let's take an example. For example, there's a bank robbery and there's 20 people there. And some will perceive this, it'll be, a, it'll be a traumatizing experience, while others may come out strong. So what I want to focus here is the individual. What conditions lead to one person not being as traumatized or traumatized at all, 
while the other gets uh, severely traumatized. Is this perhaps something to do with parenting or psychological strength or the perception mechanism? Or is this just um, something so complex that psychology cannot distinguish between two people that may have the same environment, same experience, but come out very differently? There's multiple reasons that people have very different responses to trauma. And you're absolutely right. If you had a group trauma, a bank robbery where 20 people were present, and in fact, we have examples all the time, natural disasters, a hurricane, an earthquake, hundreds if not thousands of people are affected. Some come out with severe post-traumatic stress disorder, others don't. There's several reasons there's been a lot of research on this. So we kind of do have an idea of this. We can't predict it precisely, but we definitely know who's going to be more vulnerable. Number one, a history of mental health issues. People who have existing mental health issues, depression, anxiety, personality disorders, any of those issues can actually magnify the likelihood that a person may have a stronger reaction to the trauma. Number two, a past history of trauma. We do know that trauma can be very additive, maybe even multiplied. In other words, if a person has a history of trauma from childhood, if a person has a history of trauma from other times in their life, that that can end up becoming getting to be quite magnified. So in other words, let's say a person was assaulted as a child or abused as a child, and then they are exposed to a trauma later in life, the probability is that they're going to have a stronger trauma reaction. Another piece to this, and an important one, is the perceived controllability of that stress. So in other words, this is why we see very different. So in other words, people who are in military situations, they sometimes feel in more control. Not always. Many people in the military did develop post-traumatic stress. But if you're just walking down the street and something random happens, you might feel completely out of control. But if it's a circumstance where you may feel you have more control, your perceived sense of control at the time the trauma happens also is a predictor of whether or not you'll have a traumatic stress reaction. Other factors go back to what I was saying earlier, things like the severity of the stressor, the proximity, how long it happened. So the severity would be, were people getting shot and killed in that robbery? Or was it the sense of menace and nobody actually got physically harmed? You may see differential reactions there. So it's all of those things sort of combine. And then we can sort of almost model out or predict whether or not somebody is more or less vulnerable to developing a traumatic stress reaction. And, you know, is it a perfect science? No. So some people, the very first time they're exposed to a trauma, have a severe reaction? Absolutely. There likely may be, there's actually believed to be, and they're looking at this more and more, are there people whose brains are wired a certain way? So for example, are there even vulnerabilities that come from a child who may not have experienced direct trauma as a childhood, but may, in childhood, but may have experienced uh, poverty, may have experienced neglect, may have experienced any of these things, that that might also create a vulnerability because of issues around stress hormones. So you can see it's a very complicated system. And so to some degree, we can predict it. But since we all don't walk around with our psych histories in our pockets, we don't always know these things. And so by the time the trauma comes, we have to construct it sort of backwards. My criticism of psychology, and if I correct me if I'm wrong, is perhaps the lack of focus of what you mentioned also, the socio-economic conditions that may lead to trauma. For example, Bangladeshi workers that are working in uh, garment factories over a long period of time are subjected to miserable wages. Or even in the United States, uh, I was reading on Amazon how these uh, workers were still de de delivering during COVID-19, scared, and they, many of them were uh, paid very, very poorly before and also during the crisis. And some people are suffering, for, for example, just to make a living on a daily basis. Do you think these sort of conditions also create um, the perfect ground uh, for trauma? And do you think it is addressed enough by psychologists? Or is, do you think is psychology very individual focus on personal experience, ex experiences? I think that what it comes down to is that we, we have to look at a person holistically. There is a, an, a, there's a diagram written by this guy named Bronfenbrenner. Okay, so it's what we call this sort of, um, God, I, I want to say a biopsychosocial model. I might be calling it the wrong thing. But it's four concentric circles. In the middle of the four circles is the individual. The next circle is the family. 
the next circle is the community, and the largest circle is the society. We need to understand those inter those sort of nested circles to really understand trauma, because you brought up a very important point. This idea, and we're seeing it so pronounced in the world, where we're seeing so much stratification, the people at the top have everything, and the people at the bottom, economically, have almost nothing. And being treated poorly at work, living under other circumstances, which may not qualify as trauma, but the cumulative disrespect, discontrol, uncertainty, all accumulate to make a person more vulnerable to trauma. In a way, it sort of robs a people of resilience because they don't have that sense of certainty and predictability. Predictability, sadly, has increasingly become a luxury in our world. Often the less you have, the less predictability, the less certainty, and the less control you have. And we know those issues when you don't have those things you're more vulnerable to anxiety. I'd be anxious if I don't know what tomorrow looks like. I'd be anxious if I don't know if I'm going to eat tomorrow. In many ways, the pandemic has thrust us into an interesting space, right? We ha all had certain lives in January and February. None of our lives look like that anymore. But interestingly, many people who are classified as essential workers who never got the chance to step away are having to put themselves into unsafe situations day after day after day. I would argue that that accumulation of exposure, that accumulation of stress, that at some level has a traumatic flair to it because it's inescapable. Most Hollywood films, in particular war films, show trauma arising when an individual has a horrifying experience on the battlefield. Or other films like Joker, he has a very bad experience and becomes a villain, whereas Batman confronts uh, his trauma where he lost his uh, parents and he uh, was afraid of bats and becomes sort of a hero. Hence, I've always wondered why people have chosen different routes in their life. For example, I've also seen films when I was younger where uh, someone had a traumatic experience in the university or school and turns out to be a killer. Um, what do you make of this uh, portrayal of trauma in popular culture? And also, uh, and this is the more important question, um, what leads to people becoming more negative as, of, as opposed to overcoming trauma and positive? What is the differentiation here? There's a danger in, in how trauma has often been portrayed cinematically. There's a danger when we only view it at the, as the most, at the most extreme. What's interesting is, is the conversations about trauma and post-traumatic stress have really only arisen since World War II. When, when people were coming back from World War II and they called it, um, oh, there, was a, there was a name that they, they, um, they used for it and it's gonna come to me. See, I'm showing you my age, I'm not remember, you know, um, but they, they would, they would shell-shocked. They'd come back shell-shocked. That was the term they would use. And there was the syndrome of shell-shocked was really what would then transform into post-traumatic stress disorder. And there were actually a lot of politics around it in the United States and how veterans would get their health care and all of that. But it was at that time we started identifying this experience of trauma and then expanded it. Because I have to be honest with you, until then, there was a lot of treating trauma historically as like, that's just life. You know, these things happen in life. And she's been a little bit off since that thing happened to her, right? Not viewing it as trauma and a psychological experience. But in movies, when we focus on trauma, we tend to focus on things like severe assault, uh, war, uh, sexual assault. Those are the kinds of things that get focused on. And while those are obviously all traumas, there are many, many other things that qualify. But the other issue is, is how quickly people can just be put together and everything's fine and they can, you know, and it, it's not quick. Healing from trauma is a process and it is a process. It doesn't mean it can't happen. And all of us who do trauma-based work, we see that it requires paying attention to the research, being consistent, consistent early intervention, when, as soon as possible, as close to the trauma, we try to bring people in to start working it through. But the next point you raised is absolutely critical, which is whenever we view trauma, we, we almost 99% of the time view it as this experience that destroys a person. There is a burgeoning, promising literature on post-traumatic growth. Now, some of that work has its roots back in Viktor Frankl's work and other existential psychologists and psychiatrists' writings since World War II, who have said, from suffering can come meaning and purpose. Don't create suffering, but it'll come to you. And most, most of us find suffering and some find trauma. Frankl's work was particularly um, uh, transformational in this way because he's saying under the worst conditions of trauma, 
people who had survived concentration camps, there were some who were actually in their recovery process able to derive some form of, they could, they could make some meaning out of it, make some meaning out of their suffering, not what happened to them, but out of their suffering. And then those were people who actually ended up having better outcomes in life. He himself had survived the concentration camp. So I think that this idea of post-traumatic growth, a lot of it has to do with meaning. It has to do with purpose. It has to do with social connection. It has to do with getting treatment. Yes, it may have to do with pre-existing resiliency features, but I have to say some of the lectures I've heard on post-traumatic growth, some great research out of South Africa, great research in the United States, obviously some of the anecdotal reports, Pete Frankel's work since the world, or since after World War II, has, all, has shown us that to me, and I tell this to my clients all the time, you've been through trauma. To me, you're a warrior. You're a survivor. You're a fighter. You are definitely not to me a victim. I won't even use that word. I think it becomes part of somebody's tapestry, but you have to do the work. You have to create a safe space and hold space for someone to talk about it and help them work it through. So I think that's an absolutely essential piece. To me, it is. it can be an important part of the healing journey, but there's we do often seek growth in people when they have the opportunity to get the treatment and intervention that they need. The next question will be based on media and news. And as a journalist, I have always wondered the implications of my work. Every day there is horrifying news coming out, whether it is police brutality, wars abroad, or death rates through the corona pandemic. What is your opinion on the consumption of such news? On one hand, it is vital for journalists like me to keep the public informed, uh, while on the other hand, I know it negatively impacts the social health of people. For example, I've heard people talk, talk to me and said, hey Zen, I like the work that you're doing at Activism Munich, but I just can't take the negativity all the time and I need to have some space between the news that is coming out daily because we don't have formats like good news, for example, um, or solution-oriented news. It, it doesn't really, people don't click if it says uh, 20 people got healed today from the coronavirus. People click when it says 1,000 people died today. So what sh should we do in this dilemma where on one part we're trying to inform people while on the other part we're scaring people? I would say this. Number one, I think part of the problem is how we link monetization in media, right? You know, in the United States, there's that old yarn, if it bleeds, it leads. People want that, you know, they, sadly, that's what sells. And news, news agencies are in the business of making money. That's, that's a fact. And as long as those two things are linked, sensationalism is what's going to sell. Nobody's going to go to a performance, hey, hey, come see a bunch of ordinary people walk across the stage. You're absolutely right. So what that means is let's go back to that point of controllability. I tell everyone, we don't have a lot of control these days. And I view the world as almost a circle. What's outside the circle, what's inside the circle. Everything inside the circle is what you can control. You can't control the pandemic response. You can't make a vaccine. But what you can do is turn off the news coverage. Give, give your, put yourself on sort of a restricted sort of news diet, as it were. Allow yourself 30 minutes, maybe 20, 30, 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the afternoon. Turn off the notifications where the news is constantly popping up on your device. Because I think that what is happening is people are getting too much information. They are getting paralyzed. They are getting anxious. They are going down all these dark alleys and getting more and more news. And after a while, it's all conflicting with each other and it's confusing. So I do tell people, choose the most reliable news sources you know give yourself 15 to 30 minutes a day, and then you call it done. Because that's the, that's the controllability, predictability piece. You can control that. You can predict when you're going to look at the news. This thing's going to be raging and rolling on whether or not you're reading about it or not. And that's where that meaning and purpose piece comes. Fill the rest of your day with meaningful, purposeful, affiliative activities, whether that's a distance to visit, whether that's a Zoom call, whether that's reading, working, doing something that matters to you or that you have to do, you know, and do those things. And then you can create some kind of balance. We live in an age where we're overwhelmed with information. It's a massive contributor to anxiety. And after every natural disaster, natural event, mass shooting, you name it, psychologists always say the same thing please turn off the news for a little while because otherwise the anxiety is going to build up to a level that it really feels destabilizing. And to your point about trauma, all of this anxiety provoking news is actually even more triggering for people with histories of trauma for whom modulation of fear is very challenging at times. So all of these fear-oriented stimuli hitting someone with a trauma history is really actually a recipe for a person feeling very destabilized.
What do you make of this uh, term called generational trauma, where one generation is just by genetically uh, passes on trauma to the other? Um, I've read some articles on it online. I don't know how um, solid the information is. It kind of sends uh, a little bit of fear if I, for example, is born in a war-torn country and I just get passed down something from my family uh, directly maybe in terms of the way my family behaves towards me or indirectly through genetics um, and I can't have any control over it. Uh, what is uh, your research or your assessment being on this uh, term called generational trauma? So generational trauma is actually a little bit more subtle than what you're saying. It's not like my father had trauma, I'm going to be born, I'm born with trauma. It's not that at all. What ends up happening is when we look at intergenerational cycles, it's much more subtle. For example, the mother who carries a pregnancy in a refugee camp, in a war-torn country, under conditions of trauma, we are going to see that she has a less hospitable, as you will, prenatal environment for that child. She has more stress hormones going through her body. That is going to affect fetal development, those epigenetics I was just talking about. Now the baby is born. The baby has two very stressed parents. Generationally, what happens is trauma can also beget other behavioral patterns too, like the likelihood of relationship violence, you know, exposure to other community violence, exposure to the other violence in the child's world. So by generational, uh, tra generational trauma, it doesn't mean that you're just born and it's bad luck. Well, my parents went through trauma and now I have a traumatic stress. It's not that at all. It's that trauma begets this entire cluster of issues, including poverty, including instability, including the greater hood of ex violence exposure, whether in the home or outside of the home, a greater likelihood of poorer education, unless the family is able to transition away from that. So if the parents grew up and married and even had their children in an area of war or conflict or violence, and then managed to move their young family into a place that's safer, they migrate to that new place. Generational trauma may argue that some of the leftover impacts, the parents having those post-traumatic stress profiles, then can appear in their behavior and how they parent their child and how they treat their child, which isn't optimal for the child and can impact the child. Now, if those parents migrate and they get the support they need and they're given parenting training, and therapy and the assistance they need to build a safe and happy space and are helped in assimilating and, and, and adjusting to their new society, we could mitigate those impacts. We don't do these things. We take people who are already traumatized from one situation, move them into another that's allegedly safer, and then just sort of leave them there to flounder and figure it out. We have to support people. That, emp that lack of empathy and that lack of compassion is something that's hobbling our world right now. If we could cut that through all of, uh, all of our policies, we would have so much of a safer, healthier, and frankly, I think more, um, more even economically enriched world. But when the people making the decisions want all the wealth for themselves with little regard for the people who are vulnerable, we're going to keep playing out these generational cycles in perpetuity. One of the things I always hear is when I talk to people, uh, there's a lot of comparisons taking place. For example, if I say, look at this immigrant family that's come here and they were traumatized and they couldn't make it and they're suffering, then I usually hear, well, look at the other immigrant family. They made it through. Or if I talk to some other people that um, didn't uh, get their university application time due to depression, uh, then I usually hear, hey, it doesn't matter. The guy or the girl has to stand up and do it because I did it and I came from a background which was much more difficult. Uh, I had to work overnight. So my question is, should we be comparing? Uh, because the argument for that would be comparison is good because it sets sort of a social standard. While on the other hand, I could see it's not differentiated. What is your take? Should it be a mixed bag or does this fall on the one hand or the other? 
comparison is in general not very good because I'm not, you don't know my backstory. You know very little about me. So if you started comparing to me and same vice versa, I know very little about you. You can see how very quickly we can get ourselves into a really tricky space. I think that this is again where I'm talking about empathy and compassion. That if I see something, see someone struggling who didn't get the application in on time, the immigrant family that didn't make it, instead of saying, well, I'm so much better, having to create a sense of superiority over that person to stop and wonder what is it that they may be struggling with. I'm a university professor. That's my job. If students not doing well, I'd have to break it down and say, what might be happening here? And it could be any number of things. But this sort of dismissiveness, this, this unempathic rejection, this invalidation that has become so normative in a competitive society is something we enable all the time. I do agree. You can have a standard. You can also even have a deadline. And maybe somebody wouldn't make the deadline, but maybe ahead of that deadline, we would need structures in place, whether they be reminders, whether it's identifying high risk people. A person who has a history of depression will also be experiencing things like apathy and a motivation, which make it harder sometimes to they don't even feel like they're worthy of making the application. And so that's the sort of thing where mental health should be consistently built into schools to help guide that person. I don't view that as weakness. I actually view it as a tragedy if we don't support people, because this idea of mental illness as a, as a disability is a load of you know what to me. I, I think that all of us bring gifts. People who have struggled with mental health issues often are the ones who come up with unique solutions to problems, who create tremendously beautiful creative work, who write about the depth of the human experience in a way many other people can't get in touch with. We need all hands on deck as human beings. But right now, we live in this world where it's competitive, I'm superior to you. It's almost sort of like this Darwinian game of survivor, where everybody's trying to gobble up all the resources for them, view themselves as somehow better, again, that, uh, that sort of authoritarian competitive stance, it's doing nobody any good. That sense of sort of, you know, really entitlement is the only word I could say is I suffered more, so I should get more really doesn't account. I said, until you fully know another person's backstory, you don't get to say that. And so you want to take the deep dive and learn that person's story, then you and I can talk. I would like to talk about uh, coping mechanisms and uh, assessing trauma now. How can you assess trauma? Uh, in other words, what behaviors or coping mechanisms develop that an individual should be aware of uh, when he or she is traumatized? So in a, in a person themselves, so there's two approaches. One is in the person themselves who's experienced trauma and the other is people who are watching that person. The things we might look for are changes in mood and affect. The person might seem more depressed. They may become more irritable. They may become more apathetic, sort of not interested in doing anything. They may have low energy. They may be become more anxious. They may be more on edge. Their sleeping will be affected. Their appetite will be affected. They'll be less engaged in their usual routines. They may stop going to school. They may decide to stop going to work. They might sleep till three o'clock in the afternoon. They may avoid contact with all other people. They may not join a family at a meal. They may not want to join their friends Zoom call or a get together or anything. So you'll see a gradual almost pulling away out of life. Um, If you talk to trauma survivors, they'll often feel that after that experience happened, they became, they almost had an experience so different than everybody else. They feel very isolated. They feel that no one's going to understand them. And in some cases, they even feel as though their life is going to end quickly. So sometimes you might even see in some trauma survivors that they start engaging in riskier behaviors. They may um, do a dangerous sport. They may drive too fast. They may have sex with strangers. I mean, a whole host of things use drugs that put them at risk. And you may also see the person engaging in behaviors that will help them numb. They may drink alcohol. They may use drugs. They, again, the sleeping. They may engage in things, sit in front of the television for 18 hours a day that allow them to numb out because they don't want to feel. Those are the sorts of patterns we would typically see someone acutely who has experienced trauma, which is why I make that point. As soon after a trauma as possible, a person should be getting mental health services. A lot of people will do things like, tell me about it, tell me about it, tell me about it. And that might feel a lot of pressure for a trauma survivor. 
The other thing, though, is the biggest mistake people make with tra- survivors of trauma. Oh, it's going to be OK. It's going to be OK. You know what? You got to cheer up. And they'll say all this positive nonsense to them and really invalidate their experience. The most important you, thing you can do if you are close to someone who has gone through a tr- trauma and is surviving a trauma is hold space for them. Give them a safe space where you're not making them accountable. You're not telling them to cheer up. You're not telling them to get over it. Again, holding space, letting them be, being okay with their experience. Because many people just almost feel damaged by their trauma experience. They're not damaged at all. Something happened to them. But they often start integrating it. And it's that all of those things culminate in a person who does, like I said, slowly sort of cuts out of life and cuts out of other people. What about your take on... Uh, providing solutions from family members, friends, and even I've heard of a lot of groups, self-help groups, where people go, for example, try to do radical honesty or trying to uh, sit around a fire camp to talk about the, uh, these um, problems that they've faced. Um, on one hand, you have that uh, aspect in your personal network, while on the other hand, you have the psychologists who've been professionally trained and uh, can diagnose and provide you a solution. So for, my question is basically, uh, with the former group, you have sort of a emotional support where people provide you it's gonna be okay uh, I'm there for you and everything and some people get stuck there because uh, although it may be important or not some people get stuck there for example people in my friends um, a circle have come to me and I, I'm not sure if they were traumatized but they've had experiences like being together with a narcissist for a long period of time and I've gotten the feeling that I'm just here to fill up your batteries Uh, where I was trying to provide solutions, the person w didn't want to hear it. Um, they were just trying to get some energy out of me. While on the other hand, uh, you have the place, should people go to the psychologist first? Should they go to the family members? Could you provide a proper approach system of how people should deal with emotional or solution-oriented approach? So let me tell you this right now. Don't offer solutions. It's the worst thing you can do. Okay. It's not your responsibility to fix it. It may help you feel better. Like you've done something. You know, what's a lot harder is to sit with someone's pain and that you, you were given the relationship of someone who survived a toxic relationship. Okay. You got to remember that a person in a toxic relationship has experienced no validation for a long time. They're in a relationship with somebody who consistently invalidates them, who gaslights them, who doubts their reality. So when they talk to other people, you saying you need to end this relationship, that's no use to them. They already know this. What they need, and you said, I feel like I have to fill their batteries. Yes, and you're their friend. So that's what you need to do is you need to be empathic, be present, be compassionate, validate their reality. That's friendship. And if a person says, I don't want to do that, I'd say, then you need to let that friend go because that's what they need and let them find friends who can give that to them. So I think that what we, and again, my job as a therapist is actually sometimes to hear the same story 500 times, but I don't view that as a waste of time. I view that as a letting go. And when people don't leave these toxic relationships, they spend 167 hours of a week being invalidated and one hour a week with me being validated. It's definitely off balance. I think a lot of people, we live in, two, especially in the West, in, in the Western world, we live in too fixy a culture. We have to fix everything. Do this. Join this group. Here's a brochure. Here's a website. Get this app. No. We are so afraid of negative feeling states. Now, obviously, when negative feeling states spin out of control, anxiety disorder, major depression, post-traumatic stress, that's when it has to come to my office. But for most of us, when we're having a bad day or a negative mood state, like, oh, I don't want to feel like this. I don't want to feel like this. And we, we like, I have to fix this. I said, no, you don't. Negative moods are as much a part of life as positive moods. Hold some space. They will pass. There's something to be learned there. In fact, I would believe evolutionarily negative moods were often assigned to the system Get some time for yourself. Go up to go do something. Be alone. In fact, people like Charles Darwin actually tried to argue that. He tried to argue that that depression has to be evolutionarily adaptive. He himself was depressed because so many people are depressed. He thought it might be a moment for people to go be by themselves and figure it out on their own. But instead of saying, we got to figure out a way to cheer you up, 
the best way we could, a thing we could say to someone is say, it sounds like you're having a tough day. How can I hold space for you? How can I help? And they might say, I don't know, and say, then I'm just going to sit here with you and we can just sit here quietly and that's okay. That is something we as helpers and supporters need to learn to be there for others. And then when it's our turn, we need to be clear that that's an okay thing to ask for. How to approach someone who has trauma but is unwilling to take it seriously? That's something I also hear about people uh, from uh, partners, for example, that are trying to be supportive, as you say, and saying, hey, maybe we can go together to get you help. And the person is just denying and saying, getting more and more stubborn and saying, I don't want to. I'm, I'm not crazy. I, I don't want to go to a shrink. You know, there's still a perception in, in, in many circles in our, our, uh, in our country, um, in our society, Uh, going to a shrink means you're crazy uh, even though I personally believe even healthy people should go to a psychologist just for self-reflection purposes but uh, how do you get to a partner who is um, trying to get um, his husband or wife to go to a psychologist um, how do you motivate somebody like that I would say that number one is that don't make it a direct ask like you got to go see someone, right? Because it almost feels like I don't want to deal with this anymore. You need to go talk to someone else. I think it becomes integrated into a more supportive conversation. You know, when you're saying to them, they're, they're talking and sharing their feelings and say, this sounds very, very hard. And, it, and what's, what is, you know, you tell them, it's what's striking me is that there's so many things you used to love to do and you're not doing those things you love to do. And you help them, you want them to be a stakeholder in this decision making, right? And I think the challenge is, is that we as a society have to learn to get more, uh, more comfortable with other people's discomfort. And I think that the challenge is people are saying, oh, this is too big for me. I got, they got to go to, they have to go to a psychologist. I don't want to talk about this. And it becomes very much a command or it's a dismissiveness versus I'm seeing so many changes in you and you aren't, you, you aren't, you used to love to paint and you're not painting anymore. Are there things you think could help? How could I help Do you even think anyone else could help? Like, can we, let's, let's think about this together because I want you to get back to that enriched life. Now, I'm not saying that someone's necessarily going to say, well, yes, you're absolutely right. And I'm going to go to therapy. But I think if it's a more gentle approach, that that helps a lot. If somebody asks you that question, I say, I, say, I don't know what to do. Instead of being exasperated, say, oh, for God's sake, you should go to a therapist and say that. You know, there's a lot of things we could think about here. I think the one thing that's going to be very important is that this is actually actually beyond what I know I can do well for you. And I know this would actually be going smoother for you if we could find someone to talk to. So I think that it, it to not make it so from a point of exasperation, but from a point of collaboration is where you're going to get a lot more success. And it goes to that original point, this idea that people only go to therapists if they're crazy. Listen, I work with a lot of work, have worked, will work, do work with a lot of people. I would not call one of them crazy. I think these are incredibly sane human beings that are courageous enough. I think going to therapy is about courage. I think it's about self-reflection. I think it's about wisdom to get into a room and be willing to be able to trust and be vulnerable, that makes you the strongest person in the place if you're able to do that. And so I have to say that I think that that's really where, to me, if we can reframe how therapy is thought of, but we're not there in our society yet. And I think that to the degree it feels collaborative rather than a command, a person may be more likely to sort of go along with it. And a final piece is that, you know, Viktor Frankl has this great quote. He says, abnormal behavior in response to an abnormal situation. No, an abnormal response to an abnormal situation is normal behavior. And that's what I often tell people. Like, I can't, I'm, I'm abnormal. I mean, you're not abnormal. If I was going through what you're going through, I would be doing something the same. Like, I think that we're so used to people should just quickly dust off and get back to life that we have to remember that when people are going through terrible times right now, the whole, uh, certainly all of the United States is and other parts of the world to differing degrees with the pandemic, None of us have normal lives. So a lot of us are behaving in ways that feel abnormal. And that's what we have to remember. This, this pandemic in some ways is a collective trauma that is expecting everyone differently, but none of us are behaving in our usual ways for the most part. To me, that's not because everyone has gone mad. It's because we're all in an abnormal situation. And I think that if you can let someone know there's absolutely nothing wrong with you, you've been through something very difficult, very difficult. And the fastest way 
to get you healed again. If you had a broken leg, we wouldn't let you sit on it for two months. Right now, we just need to almost give you a sort of a psychological tune-up. Would you consider therapy? What do you make of this term called projectionism? There are certain psychologists, I don't want to name them, that talk about projectionism um, as a way to cope with some inner disbalances or void or perhaps traumas in which they then project their problems onto the government or uh, top level CEOs. Um, especially in the field of activism and social change, I do notice, for example, that certain people have come here, but they're still their life is not puzzled together. It's not together. Um, they're struggling just to clean their room or simply to fix certain things in, in, in their um, social network, their relationships, but yet want to change something in society. Is projectionism um, a sort of a way to cope with a trauma or certain imbalance? It can be. I think it's an interesting example. Like you can't keep your own house in order. You're angry at the world. You're going to blame these structures. Here's the key. I actually agree to some level, the way we've organized the world, these corporate structures, our governmental structures, they're obviously not working. Okay. We, we are a very stratified, unequal, unjust society, world, globe right now. Okay. That we, I, I think many, not all obviously would agree with that, but I agree with that. The issue then becomes how much we take personal responsibility for our piece in it. And that personal responsibility starts same with how we treat the people around us. If you're going to go yammering on about this CEO, this president, this prime minister, this cabal, all of that, great. But if you're mistreating the people in your close spheres, your partner, your parent, your friend, I ain't buying that. You have got to keep your side of the street clean. Humanity starts at home. Do not start trying to bring down the CEO of Apple if you're treating your wife or husband or children badly. Get your house in order. Say, I'm angry. Uh, that's the reason I'm treating my wife badly because I'm mad at a corporation. I am not buying that. That is victim talk. I am not hearing that. I judge people on the way they treat the people closest to them. That's where we begin. And if you are treating them badly and claiming to be on some activist rant, that feels like narcissism. That does not feel like activism. Overcoming trauma, can it be done by itself? And in particular, I'm asking this question because we have this sort of arrogance in Western society um, to project what we have here onto other societies. So for example, I'm from Pakistan and people don't even have uh, awareness on mental health issues, you know, over there. So what do we do about the, uh, so many people that are suffering, they don't even know how, um, how, they don't have the mental resources to deal with, or even societal resources like government structures, a social system, and going to a psychologist is only reserved for the upper class. So within that framework, can a person overcome trauma itself? And if not, what can we do to support these people? Zane, you're bringing up a huge public health crisis. WHO has identified mental health as a massive public health crisis. We tend to reserve that term for pandemics and infectious diseases. But the reason, the fallout of something like a pandemic or anything else is the mental health crisis. And one of the greatest elements, pieces of this mental health crisis is the lack of available mental health workers. My family's from India, so I completely resonate with the crisis that's also happening in Pakistan. There's an absolute lack of mental health workers in in South Asia and frankly throughout the world I'd even argue in the United States believe it or not so and when there is access to mental health it's often expensive it's difficult to reach sometimes the providers aren't able to handle a whole range of issues people don't know how to pick a mental health provider so this is a massive global public health crisis do I think someone can figure this out by themselves? Not completely. I think if a trauma is pretty significant, if it's not addressed, it's almost like can a bone heal itself? Yeah, in some cases it can, but it won't heal right. And that arm or that leg is really not going to work properly. A person's always going to have a little bit of a limp. My job as a psychologist is to help people heal in a way that they don't have that little bit of a limp, or at least we can, we can hide it a little bit and they can get through life as optimally as possible. And so but the fact is what's happening, and this is where I see some potential utility to the internet, is that more and more and more of us, certainly I put out a lot of free content, there are people who put out low cost content, 
is that there, at least there's mo more information online that gets to many people that could direct them to important books, to important resources. There are techniques that can be self-driven like meditation and mindfulness work that can definitely help address issues around anxiety. But I, I mean, listen, I think that works to a point and I think those are great tools to sort of keep in your pocket. But when it comes to big ticket issues like trauma, especially if it's been complex trauma that's played out for many, many years, I don't think this is somebody who's in a, in a position to fix this on their own. I think there are many courageous NGOs out there that attempt to address gender-based violence, that attempt to address mental health. These NGOs are overrun. They simply can't even provide the level of service they need to everyone because they're they're underfunded. There's so few of them. So I wish I could say something more optimistic here. I'm being a realist. We have a crisis. We have we have an issue. We know there's a solution, and because of stigma and bias, we're not implementing the solution. If I had but one dream, it would be to go into regions of this world like South Asia and create a massive mechanism of training, even lay level people to do some very basic, simply holding space, being present, not judging. A big part of mental health treatment is to sit with someone in a room and to not judge them. And unfortunately, in too many of these situations, particularly when the trauma is viewed through a stigmatized lens in a given society, a great example would be sexual assault against a woman. That woman is the one who's often blamed and faces even more stigma from her culture. That trauma is even worse sometimes than the original trauma. And many times if a mental health worker isn't trained, could re-traumatize re that person. So these, I, do I don't think someone can magically self-help themselves? No. I think there's some wonderful workbooks out there and all of that. But when it comes down to brass tacks, those workbooks are meant to be used in conjunction with therapy and with therapists who are properly trained and understand how to talk about trauma in a humane, respectful, informed manner. To my last question, I would like to get your take on a universal basic income and what your psychological, uh, as a psycholo psychologist, your perspective is on it. Um, getting ba the basic needs such as rent, uh, uh, food expenses, uh, electricity, uh, perhaps even internet uh, provided for free. Um, do you think that could alleviate a lot of experiences that people have on a daily basis for I'm not talking about the Western countries but at least in developing countries um, overcome the conditions that they face on a day-to-day -day basis that may lead to trauma um, what is your take on a basic universal income I think that a basic universal income is a first step, but I think it goes far beyond that, Zane. We need to educate people. We need to give people educations, educations they can see through that um, that will result in jobs and jobs training of sustainable jobs where they're not vulnerable to the vagaries of the weather, where, you know, for example, farming and other agricultural pursuits, where they're not as vulnerable to the vagaries of much more tyrannical power structures and I can't highlight enough how important it is to get women educated and much more financially independent. It's those interdependent economic cycles that have kept many women imprisoned in abusive relational situations. Simply educating women could be the single most powerful public health intervention in addition to making therapy available. I don't think this is just about a universal basic income. It's also about the sense that I get up and I can do a job and upon doing that job, I'm able to take care of the people I care about. It's a way of also creating a way that it, when people have young children, that there can be a person who's financially providing, somebody who's also taking care of children, but that there is a way to ensure that when there are tough moments, the economy shifts or something, that there's a way for those people to live in a way that feels respectful, that feels safe. We know that under conditions of trauma, when enough stress is placed on the system, that's where things can crack. And we can see, for example, intrafamilial violence, gender-based violence, a lot of these trends come up. And a lot of these are sort of reinforced by these problematic, problematic economic structures. Right now, the way the economy of the world is devised is it's very cruel. If you can't figure out a way to make money, well, then you deserve to suffer. It's punitive and it's harsh. It's narcissistic, I'll be frank with you. It is unempathic, it is cold, it's entitled, it's dismissive, and it's invalidating. This is beyond, yes, I think universal basic income is a huge 
huge first step, but I think this is much, much more. This is about much, much more collaborative, compassionate business structures. This is about education. This is about jobs training. And this is about the fact that too much of the wealth of the world is stratified in the hands of too few. This zero sum game approach to economies is unsustainable, it's disrespectful, and it's cruel. These big, beautiful brains of ours know how to be humane. We need to start using them. Dr. Romani, author, clinical psychologist, and professor of psychology at the California State University, thank you so much for your time. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Zane. And thank you guys for tuning in today. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking on the bell below and to donate so we can continue to produce independent and nonprofit news and analysis. I'm your host, Zan Raza. See you guys next time.